Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here with another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. And joining me today is Luke Gross. He and his wife, Catherine, operate Gross Family Farm in Riddle, Indiana. They farm full-time, producing six species of animals for meat on pasture, chickens, pigs, ducks, turkeys, beef, and cattle. Their products are offered locally through a meat CSA, wholesale accounts, and farmer's markets. Beyond thinking, speaking, and sharing about ecology, business, marketing, and efficient farm management, Luke and Catherine spend their time raising five children. Luke is also the host of the Pasture Raised podcast. Welcome to the show, Luke. Thanks, Michael. Glad to be here. So talk to me a little bit about um, how did you get your start in farming? Sure, yeah. Um, About, goodness, I guess it's 12 years ago now, um, my wife, um, I guess soon to be wife was in a vegetable CSA and she was volunteering on this fellow's farm. And I was, you know, I guess having a a mid twenties crisis where I knew I didn't want to be in the career I was in. And um, in, in working with this guy a couple of times in his vegetable farm, we, and as we were kind of imagining what a life together might look like, we started dreaming about having a farm and um, I'd, I ended up working for that fellow for a year on his veg farm and, and uh, running a farmer's market for him. And then, um, and then we, we, uh, we decided we wanted to go ahead and jump in and we started raising some layers and vegetables on our own. And we did, we had veg for about four years. And then we started um, being interested in um, some different ways of making our, our farm more profitable, but also some ways that, you know, expanding outside the plant kingdom could potentially have a more regenerative impact on on the land we farmed and so um, we we got access to some more ground and started doing pigs and eventually um, chickens and everything else and that's sort of the the root of how we ended up um, doing what we do now more or less very cool now talk to us a little bit about your management styles for the farm how do you raise the animals sure i mean the the short version of it is we um, we raise everything on pasture. Um, we 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 sell pasture raised meats. Um, all the omnivores get a non GMO grain, and then the um, sheep and and cattle are one hundred percent grass fed. But it's it's all um, part of a um, interrelated you know rotational grazing system basically. And so the I I, I don't know how much deeper you want me to go right now on that, but well, talk to us a little bit about um, your your chicken operation. I know you do some unusual things with that, how you have those raised. So I just wanted to dive into that a bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so there's there's some other folks who do something similar to what we do, but um, I, I guess we've been become somewhat known for our chicken raising system, which is more or less, um, some people call it day range, but nobody gets locked up at night. So I don't, I don't, um, I don't usually call it that, but just we range our birds behind electric netting. Um, that goes for all of our birds, turkeys, ducks, and chickens. And they they essentially have a shelter. Uh, if you think of the area in the electric netting like a football field, um, um, we'll, we'll put the birds in one end of the football field with shelters, feeders, waterers, everything they need. And then we'll just drag them from one end zone all the way to the other end zone. So. So our chickens just, um, they, they start on one end of their electric netting area and we just move everything um, a, few, a, a few dozen feet down the field uh, as they go. And, and they pretty much just follow where the shade, the water, the food is, wherever the stuff that they want. And they, they stay behind the netting and the, the, between the netting and the um, livestock guardian dogs and the geese we have on the farm, um, they kind of keep the predators at bay. And, um, and that's sort of how we do it. We try to not have to um, not to have to have as, as much heavy infrastructure and we give the bit, birds a bit more freedom to, to roam and mm-hmm. kind of choose where they want to be in or so, out, in or out of the, the, the roof. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and so how often do you move the uh, fence then? It depends on how big the section of netting is and um, it depends some on, uh, I guess, exactly how, um, how, how far we're moving them um, each time because if, if they're 
if they're ranging out further and pooping further, we'll move them a little bit further, but more or less, we'll move the netting of twice a week or so. Um, whenever they get to the end of the football field, we just kind of um, collapse the back part of it and tack onto the front end of it, basically. It's like a, a halo that goes around with them, basically. That's yes. Gotcha. So you use two nets then for every single setup? Well, it's not like netting with sheep or pigs, where if you open up up one panel on the end, they're all just going to pour out like water out of a, a hole in the bottom of a cup. Um, chickens, they'll move, but um, yeah. they're not going to move that fast. So we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll have, I'll have three or four seconds of netting that I'll make their paddock out of. And then once they get to one end of it, I'll take the back two sections off and tack them onto the front ah. of the paddock and expanding it out. So, you know, that wouldn't work with, with a, with the, like a netting with sheep, they'll just bump out, yeah. but it's hot and they're out there underneath the shade and they, they don't just run for the, the freedom <laughs> they're yeah. they range, but not like that. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. And uh, so you've got the livestock guardian dogs and you don't have overhead predators or they, the livestock guardian dogs help with that. Um, I'm sure there is some of that. Um, but we, we do have pretty good luck, um, you know, between the, the geese kind of just being a, a loud rude um, yeah. um, presence on the ground in the paddock. And then the dogs kind of roaming around. Um, you know, if we have some mortality, I'll, I'll notice the, the vultures will kind of go to wherever, uh, you know, a bird died in the field, a rainstorm or whatever. But um, we've, we haven't really seen much predation from the birds. I, I know that hawks would, would like to walk off or fly off with, the, with some of the younger ones when they're out there. But we do wait till they're about three, three and a half weeks old before we put them on pasture. And that, that kind of helps with most of them not being carried away. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's something we try to keep an eye on, but but the aerial predators um, haven't haven't affected us too much with all those those different um, different strategies we're employing. Gotcha. Um, how big is your cattle herd? Right now, um, we're we're only on twenty acres, and the pasture is pretty good. But we, I think we've got a twelve head out there right now. But it'll okay. it'll fluctuate. We we've done some cow calf, but mostly we're just bringing in stockers and. And, uh, and finishing them out on grass. Gotcha, gotcha. And the the pigs are those in the woods or are those in pasture? How does that work? Yeah, our, our pigs are are mostly in the woods, um, particularly when there's kind of you know any heat to the weather. But we do have a kind of low bottom ground area that um, that doesn't have very good good pasture. It kind of gets a little um, boggy, and we'll we'll feed our cattle down there in the early winter with with hay, and then we'll we'll move the pigs down there to kind of bed down in the wasted hay and so there there's a little bit of open ground the pigs will end up in but usually they're they're in, in a little bit of woods we've got in the back of our farm gotcha gotcha now in the the turkeys um wh what time of year do you start with those because obviously there's a process for the thanksgiving market yeah for the most part um we probably will do a spring batch next year because we found that we really are able to sell quite a bit of ground turkey and people really like that product Okay. It's a lot, but right now we're in, we're doing, uh, we started in late July with the turkeys and, um, I want to say we started around 400. Um, and we, we got them, you know, they're out in pasture by mid September and we're, we're moving them to, um, to paddocks and fresh netting every, um, every about twice a week as well. And they're, they're, they're doing great out there. And we, we try to have them ready to go fresh by the week week of like week before Thanksgiving and we'll probably um we'll probably sell a third of those retail and a third of those wholesale and then a third of them will get ground up for for ground turkey like okay that. and when you grind for ground ground turkey turkey do you process the whole bird or do they do the drumsticks as well or you save those a, a back um I think our butcher uh, because of some of the um ligaments um or sinews that are in that drumstick um, the deboning of that raw meat is difficult for them or, or they they claim that it's it's not worth it and doesn't really work out and so they will give me um debone drumsticks and giblets and a few other things separate but for the most part all the all the thigh wing and breast are ending up in the grind gotcha gotcha so what does a typical week look like for you on the farm well it's definitely varied a lot over time and and it, even within this year, it's varying. But we've um, we've hired on uh, a number of kind of gig workers as well as a 
a main farmhand. Um, and so a lot of my days I'm kind of making sure that he's got everything he needs in place to, to do all the chores, um, except for the days where he's off and I'm, I'm doing all the chores. But um, I, uh, you know, spend some effort in the morning just kind of doing office work time and stuff like that. And if I figure if I don't get up at 4 a.m., then there's very little chance that I'll have any quiet moments where I can actually um, think mm -hmm. we've got a house with five young children. So um, that's that's the time where the office um, has the has the capacity for work to be done. So I do that then and then, um, you know, cook breakfast for the kids and um, and then get out the door after breakfast. And usually I'm setting up things, making sure he's got everything he needs. And then I'm, you know, managing some series of truck drivers and um, who haul animals for me or people who are doing home deliveries, um, people who are helping at farmer's markets and trying to put things in place, working with butchers and working with CSA customers, answering emails. Um, but about a half a day of chores on days when he's not here and when he is, I'll still be participating in those a little bit, but also kind of uh, managing all the things that I don't have someone else to, to help mm -hmm. me manage. Yeah. How do you stay organized? What kind of systems have you set up for that? I mean, there's, there's a few. One is I not well enough, I guess. Um, and I've, I'm always thinking about ways to, to improve our systems for sure. Um, I think that, um, the, I use Evernote a lot and some other note taking apps, things like that, where I can kind of make sure the information is, is where I need it to be. It seems like just having a single repository for, for all those little uh -huh. bits you need to tell a butcher or what's in your inventory that you have in this cold storage place. And there's, there's no, um, there's, yeah, there's, there's nobody doing that for me. So I've got to make sure we've got, we know where to find the stuff and we need it and things like that. Um, and then just, just trying to, to hone those things down and, and uh, make sure that the people, as we're starting to rely on more and more people, um, making sure that they're, you know, documenting and, and helping us to, to keep everything in order the way it should be. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I would say on that organized question. Um, that's that's uh, more or less what what it usually looks like looks like, I guess. Um, well, let me let me back up. Sorry, there. I guess there would be one more thing. I mean, there's there's a there's the organized piece per se, but then there's also just sort of the. I think it's it's really imperative to to sort of you know have in front of you as a business owner like multiple. I'll just say time horizons that you can can look on and mm. uh, it's, it's really easy to get and we spent many years where i was really doing this just getting bogged down in the details um you know i know i've got to weed these carrots and i wouldn't um and i'd do it till it's done and then i'd wake up and you know wake up from the the carrot weeding stupor and realize that um i had three other things that were actually more important that i should have been doing and i you know i it was it was really hard to kind of look past the immediate moment and the the, the thing immediately there in front of you that needs to be done, but getting better at figuring out what what you can put off or what or, or figuring out how to find ways to either mm -hmm. have someone else do it or not things that are um, un, not imperative. You know, we we just try to cut out a lot of the the things that we we've, we've learned are are not necessary. Like our chicken raising system would be an example where we we didn't want to have walls uh, heavy walls around our chickens anymore. We thought the chicken would be better for the chickens and for our lives. So we just cutting things out um that and you know getting someone else to haul livestock because i don't want to be a, a truck driver anymore and so yeah looking on those time horizons saying you know what what can we do to make this better for for me um for our farm for our animals and for our children we you know it's it's really easy in this business to work yourself to the bone and um and i think that figuring out what what what's your goal what's your what's your, what's the goal you need to solve right now? Um, I think that there's, I'm forgetting the, the business book, but um, I, I'll, I'll, I can give it to you later, but there's that business book where the guy talks about, um, that's Covey, I think, uh, and, and a couple other authors, but defining your wildly important goal. And then, and I think, I think the, the way he says it is, um, if, if there was one thing, if everything in, in your business remained constant, but one thing improved, what would that one thing be that you had had to improve? And then if you can you can figure out what that thing is and then you devote your energy towards that and figure out how to make sure everybody else, other people on your team or or mm -hmm. something can happen to make 
keeping everything else at stasis, then you'll move the most important things forward. So, you know, for me right now, uh, we've got a, we're, we're way behind on having the amount of cold storage we need. Um, and until that problem gets solved, um, we really can't move forward the way we need to. So, um, you know, that, that, that's sort of my, my wildly important goal for this fall. And then, and then we can, you know, I can organize myself to find the time to solve that problem. Uh, uh -huh. is the, the first step in, in getting there. So just thinking, thinking through problems and how to solve them and, and trying to think about where I want to be in, in a year and finding tricks and tools like that for wrapping your brain around it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. I think so often we're, as you said, the daily is the fires are burning, but we don't do the, the, the matrix. I think it's the two by two matrix of, you know, do the non-urgent, but important things, which are really going to move the business forward. And uh, because, yeah. you know, there's literally a thousand things. I mean, like today a phone call popped up and I didn't have to take it. I probably should have left it go because it actually meant that I didn't get to send an email, which should have been sent. Um, but yeah, being just turning those things off and just focus, looking at the big picture and making sure that every single week you're going back to what is the big picture and did we get that done this week? So yeah, absolutely. What would you yeah. say the hardest part about being a farmer is for you? Gosh, um, it's this is like a tough one for me to answer. Um, I think if you haven't gotten used to doing hard things, then um, you know, with with the way things are in you know the the food economy and farming in general it's it's it might not be the thing for you but mm -hmm. and so maybe I'm, I'm one of those people being that we've been doing this for a dozen years that yeah i i tend to like block out the, <laughs> the trauma from the, from the past so i can just look forward um yeah um and so there you know there's there's uh there's many many things i mean i think that probably one of the hardest things you know we I'm, I'm usually not bashful about saying that the way we were farming at first um, was was unprofitable, unsustainable um, in terms of its uh, misuse of, of human energy, um, mm. namely my human energy. Um, and so, you know, it took a while to learn that having business plans, having um, having a marketing strategy that's going to you know not require me to to spend you know, 25 hours a week, um, marketing, marketing yeah. food, the marketing $25,000 of the food. Like, um, I, I can't afford to spend that much time, um, mm -hmm. selling that much food when I, I need to have more, more, uh, effective use of my, my energy. So, you know, shedding those, those, um, rose colored glasses and moving on to something where I, I came to have a, a real understanding of business. Um, it, it wasn't hard in the same way that, you know, getting out there in the middle of the night in a cold rainy night and, um, you know, pulling, pulling dead chickens off of each other, you know, or, you know, yeah. those kind of tragedies on farming. It wasn't hard in that way. That's uh, but it, it was difficult to do and to change myself personally to the kind of person who could, um, could create the business that would work for my family. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's, a, uh, it's, it's, everybody says they could be a martyr until, the, the one day where they have to show up and do that but if mm -hmm. it's a little bit every day of um of showing up um and that's how you sort of you i'm mixing so many metaphors right now <laughs> um you, if if you're if you're ready to to show up every single day and figure out what needs to be done um you know it's not as glamorous or as as uh you know obviously momentous there's no there's no scene in a movie it's a it's a montage with music set to it it's not um the, uh -huh. the stand this the sta standing on your knees in the rain um cursing the heavens um it's not that kind of moment that um ends up i think defining it so much as um just showing up every day and and creative thinking um uh -huh. and sticking to it um, who would you say have been your, sense? Sorry. yeah, no, absolutely. That makes sense. Is it's, it's the daily moving forward, moving the business forward, whether you like to or not, it's every single day getting up and making that some changes in your business that are going to make the business better because of that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the important part. Um, and talk to us about your mentors who have been your mentors as you've been growing the farm. You know, I think that there's, there's definitely too many to name and, you know, many who I know and many who I don't, or probably many who people on this 
recording would know, many who they wouldn't know. Um, Wendell Berry is the person who's, you know, who's always a, a, a voice in my shoulder. Um, mm-hmm. I have, have been able to meet him once before, which is, which is really great, but just a, a vision for what, um, that what's the possibility of, of uh, humans interacting with land and evoking harmony um, as they do so um, with, with the land and with, with other people in their community. And, and I think it's, I think it's a beautiful picture and I think it's a possible picture. And, um, you know, I think he gets a, a, a rap sometimes for mostly pointing out problems. Um, but I, I think that, I think he can also um, describe what harmony is and, and has and does um, in, in the, in the many different kinds of writing he does. So, I mean, he's, he definitely would be the biggest name, but there are many people out there, people who um, have kind of taught me um, a lot about business, um, most of whom are not farmers, but mm-hmm. um, you know, there's, there, I spend a lot of time with podcasts and YouTube videos. Um, some of the work that um, Diego Footer and Darby Simpson have done with, with their podcasts and courses have been really, really helpful, and I've gotten to know those guys pretty well. Same with Jordan Green, who I know, I think he's been on your show before. Yeah. I, mean, I think he's a brilliant guy who, the way he thinks about business and farming are, uh, are just, um, yeah, really thoughtful and, and wise and creative. And I'm always curious to see what his perspective is. Um, I mean, he, he does, you know, he does great work in the field with his pigs for sure. And mm-hmm. he, th- he thinks about his business in a way, in a way that um, is conceptual and thoughtful. And I want to, I want to do more of that kind of thing. And so those people have just been really, really helpful. And I, I appreciate them a lot. And I'm glad I've gotten to, you know, have a chance to, to build relationships with them and, and let them know that I appreciate them a lot too, because, um, you know, they're, they're really doing great things. And I, and many others, I mean, some, some friends who just own businesses and help me think about marketing and, and, mm-hmm. and some things have been, you know, they, they don't, they, they run mutual funds or other things. <laughs> they don't, they're not anybody that anybody in the farming space necessarily would, would know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If there was, let's say, a magic reset button to go back and change your farm from the beginning or set something up differently, what would you set up differently? I think I would. So I, I would focus on like the most simple, basic, easiest to automate task first. Um, you know, standing there holding a hose or moving a hose around to fill water when you could buy a ten dollar float valve that tracks your supply. Um, thermostats to manage the temperature of the brooder. Mm-hmm. Um, I would just, I would just buy these tools and bring them in uh, as as quickly as possible, and not kind of wait to realize that I've been spending years, um, you know, wasting away um, minutes every single day. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, after after that, after kind of you know bringing in the, you know, the most simple and basic tools like that, I would I would hire help sooner, um, and you know even 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 at the point of, um, you know, once I feel confident, I've got a business that that I can scale. Um, and then once I have the, the cash flow sufficient to, to feel like we can, we can afford that person, I would, I would bring on help and, and good help and pay them well and make them want to be here um, for sure. And, and even, you know, not necessarily full-time help. We've really had great luck with some gig work, um, mm-hmm. hiring out live um, professional haulers to haul trailers full of chicken and, we did the math and it didn't really pencil out. We were doing batches of 600 and then I just decided, well, let's do batches of 1200. Um, mm. And it looks a lot better, but 1200 chickens on someone else's trailer at, at a $700 um, or $400 hauling bill than it does 600 chickens. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just figuring out how to, how to make it work, thinking outside the box um, and, and, you know, figuring out where your bottlenecks are and, and seeing if you can bring people in to help. We have a delivery driver who, delivers 80 CSA shares a month around town. And, um, you know, having these people has, has really freed us up to have whole days where I'm not um, just sitting in a vehicle um, driving meat and animals around. And yeah, and, uh, I can, I can focus on the things I need to. And those people don't need a full-time pay. Um, they're, they're fine to work two days a month or none or whatever it takes. Um, yeah. And I guess, I mean, the, the, the other thing is I just think about um, like, particularly marketing just thinking about that conceptually and having a plan understanding what it is to communicate with people understanding what people are looking for um you know people people are looking for food they're looking for sustenance but you know they're 
when they're buying from somebody who has a product like what we have, they're, they're, you, I, it took me a while to realize they're, they're wanting something more than food. They want, they want their food to come with a story. Yes. But a mm-hmm. feeling and they want to, to get something from that, 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 um, that they can share or, or make sure that, um, but whether they're sharing, sharing their values or not, that it's, it's matching up with their values and, and they want dinner to, um, to be both delicious, but kind of fill an emotional need more or less. And, you yeah. know, we're, we're, we're oftentimes, you know, I, in, in my first eight years of farming, I wasn't kind of thinking through exactly what, you know, what, what thing that that person might not even be able to articulate or is, are they thinking um, as they, you know, approach us and the products that we offer and, and the really the opportunities we give them to solve their problem by partnering with us basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That whole understanding the psychology of the marketing and uh, what their actual needs are is going to make sure that they're buying at a much better and they're going to more understand you on a much different level than just like shopping for the price. Yeah. Yeah. We, we know we can't compete on price. Um, we're, we're meeting some other goal of the consumer. And so we've got to, we, as, as we approach meeting that, we've got to figure out well, what exactly is it that, you know, they're going to want convenience. They're going to want quality. Um, but they're also going to want, um, you know, oftentimes they're, they're wanting to connect, um, to some sort of value um, that they have in, in their food. And so we have, to, we have to make sure that the convenience is there, make sure the quality is there, but we also have to make sure we're communicating that, um, we're communicating the value that we bring and, and make sure that, that they're, you know, that, that we're acknowledging that this is the kind of thing that they can feel good about in the way that they really, really want to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. With that, I'd like to stop here and take a break. In a minute, we'll be back with Luke Gross and talking all about pastured raid livestock. Hey, Thriving Farmers, have you checked us out on YouTube lately? We have a bunch of new content there, including a few rants by me. I uh, want to tell you, you don't want to miss them. Um, I actually go rant about you know some of the problems I see in our space and some of the challenges I see farmers uh, facing. So go check that out. We've got instructional videos over there as well. Talk about setting up our new farm here in Ohio and all the steps we're going to do that, as well as just tutorials and tips on best practices for all sorts of things on the farm. So go ahead, check over at Growing Farmers on YouTube and see the new content we put together for you. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here, back with the second half of this interview with Luke Gross from Gross Family Farm in Riddle, Indiana. Luke, talk to us about your team a little bit. You talked a little bit about the private haulers and how you've outsourced, but on the farm, talk to us about how you manage the, what's going on there. Yeah, so we... Like, like I said, we, we have the gig workers we talked about in our farm hand. Um, I just try to make sure that he is um, increasingly more able to manage the, the whole of the farm, um, taking care of animals, moving feed around, um, moving the animals in their infrastructure, water, if, if, that he has all the tools and knowledge that he needs to take care of things here. And he's doing that five days a week. And myself or a backup person will basically do the chores on the other two days of the week. And so um, we, we spent a lot of effort kind of getting him trained up and trying to make sure that the systems we have around here are something that, that uh, anyone can do. And it doesn't require one guy who knows where that one, one tool is um, with namely me. So we're, we're trying to make sure that I'm, I'm not necessary to have it in every place. That's really one of the keys I think is to, to make sure you figure out systems that can, can be taught without too much difficulty. Mm-hmm. So with those systems, have you developed like SOPs or operating procedures for a lot of that? And you have those written or are they more just like, this is the way to do it? I've said to myself, we're going to do that. Uh, we're going to write those, mm-hmm. these things down. Um, and we do have like a kind of basic brooder checklist. Um, we try to make sure that you know, the, the, the air, water, and food and temp- quality and quantity <laughs> more or less are all correct. You know, that the air is the right temperature and the, has the right quality to it, um, is, is clean, that the bedding is is clean, that the water and food are, are present and, and clean. And so, you know, we, we we do try to run down that, especially in some of those key areas, but I don't um, I don't have those SOPs written out yet. It's something I keep on saying I'm gonna do this winter, but um, there's a whole lot of value, whether it's a person like we have who's been here for three years or someone who's coming in in a pinch um, to be able to, 
to make sure that we're all on the same page and that um, expectations and roles are not drifting and being forgotten. Um, yeah, it's it's really useful, and I can I can wholeheartedly say that that, that that's something we we should have. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now you had a new child this summer and kind of took some time off around that. Talk to us about that. What was the thought process going into that? How did you make sure that you're able to give yourself the margin for that? Yeah, we, well, well, we, we love summer vacation <laughs> and it's not a thing I ever really thought was going to be a part of our life for the first, um, eight years of farming, but, um, three or three or four years ago, we, we sort of scheduled our entire pasture farming season around sort of having a, a halftime show. And uh, it's really changed our lives with having young kids and not just kind of feeling like the entire year is a grind and we're going to be mm-hmm. doing the same thing week in and week out. And so it, it's required a few things, um, but more or less, we, we try to make sure there's at least a week in the middle of summer where we don't have poultry on the farm. Okay. And with the baby coming, we were able to make it a lot longer than the week. Um, but we can get farm hands or someone else to um, manage, you know, for whether we're having a baby at the hospital or, um, or you know, we're going to a lake house um, or just trying to rest. We're, we're, uh, if we have pigs on farm, if we have cattle, um, sheep, someone can check on those every day or two and who knows they're doing an Amish neighbor can come just kind of lay eyes on them and stuff. We, we, we can get out of town if we need to. Um, but as long as we don't have poultry here, we're able to, to, to kick it away. And so what we've been able to do is, is just skip a batch or two in the middle of summer um, on our farm. And we have a partner farmer who raised out some of our poultry now. And so he's, he's been able to do essentially every other batch for us. Um, in past years, we were just doing a vacation. We'd skip one of our summer batches and not start our turkeys until after that. And then we'd have zero poultry here. And that was able to give us that short break. But then this year, we just skipped two batches. We had basically um, 12 weeks where there are no birds in our pasture here. We were able to kind of take a little paternity leave. And you know, paternity leave for a farmer with um, four species instead of six on, on pasture is, it may not sound, it, yeah, I was still working, but it's, it's much nicer to, to sort of just have the capacity to not have to be out in the pasture at any point in time or any particular day even. um and yeah i i uh i i, I don't I, I think that was kind of like anti-vacation at, at one point in my um idyllic farming career mm. like you know get i don't want to have a job i have to get from like that would have been a perspective i had but um you know we we do a lot of work here and i can always find something to do to keep me busy and you know with young kids i i just i i don't I don't have the discipline to just not go out and take care of this one thing. And I don't want my young kids to you know, look back on their childhood and think, you know, well, dad was always, always gone. And we never really saw him except for on rainy days. Um, like I don't really want that to be the experience of their childhood. And I want to make sure that, um, you know, we're building in time um, to, to where I can, you know, be as present as possible. We can be a family that works together, that invests together, uh-huh. play together, that is, is is a team in every way, um, but not a team where dad's just dragging you around um, and we're all just um, having to pick green beans for 12 hours a day. Uh-huh. Um, like like so many farm kids who have yeah, heard them tell the story, I, I never want to go back there again. I just want to make sure kids don't have that experience. And, and I, I'm, I'm too much of a workaholic to to stay here all the time and still try to, um, try to, try to, you know, be a, be a, be a present father. I mean, we want to make sure that we're building in cycles of rest and that we do that on a daily basis and a weekly basis. And, and, you know, every winter we're working a lot less and, and for a, a short period of time, every summer working a lot less and, and this summer, you know, because we had a baby, we're working less, but that's just been really important for us just being able to, to make sure our family is is a uh, is going to be a family that really is able to care for everybody as well as possible. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, um, with the hiring team, how have you found the right people? You know, it's 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 definitely tricky. Um, we we have uh, we have some people have come to us fortunately um as we need them um or we've you know we've, we haven't had to work too too hard to find them um i've 
I've heard um, on maybe Jordan Green's um, YouTube channel, he talks about hiring pros and not kind of being lured in by the, you know, educational labor entertainment um, arrangements that farmers oftentimes get into and just getting high quality work for people who plan to be there, who want to mm -hmm. do this as a career. Um, you know, that's, that's the kind of people we, we want to, to bring on, um, you know, where it's the gig workers, um, and you know, those, those will vary for sure, but in terms of, you know, whether or not they, someone doesn't have to want to be a delivery driver as a career to, to deliver food for us. But, um, but, you know, we, we, uh, we work with people like a professional livestock callers who have insurance and trailer breaks and things like that. Um, but then, yeah, I think that just our, our guy Sherman, he loves farming, but he doesn't really want to, he, he, he started out here interning with us sort of, he just wanted to come out and help and see what it was like. And then we offered him a job. And through working here, he realized he loved the work, but he didn't love um, the idea of managing all the business parts of it. And we said, well, you know, let's let's just um, have you do more work here and, and uh, you know, let's continue to work out good. So we've invested a lot in that in that relationship because I think it is really good and mutually beneficial. And, uh, you know, we've come to rely on him a lot. But, um, uh, yeah, we, we haven't had to, had to replace him yet, so I haven't had to um, had to think too, too hard about where we go to find find more labor. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, hopefully we won't need to replace them anytime soon for sure. Let's talk about your marketing. I know you talked about used to be a lot of restaurants and now you switched over to more CSA because of the pandemic. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you go about getting new customers. Yeah. Um, so maybe that was before we started recording, but yeah, basically we were 60% restaurants before the pandemic started. And now, you know, that's less than 10%, but um, but fortunately, people wanted meat delivered to their door, and we had the infrastructure in place to to sort of do that. So um, we were very fortunate to kind of be able to be in a position where we had had product and had had the ability to get to those customers, and and so it was it was a good good time for our business. But yeah, we've we've shifted pretty heavily from you know doing a lot of customer relations with chefs, really getting to know, connect with, slide into the DMs with a bunch of chefs, and really focusing on that. And now. You know, we, we do a little bit of that and we maintain the relationships we have, but we're focused on on our CSA members pretty heavily. Um, we've gone in this year from about 50 families getting a, a share of meat with us month to month to 200 now. And um, we're, we're just managing the communications, marketing, distribution of that, um, putting ourselves out there and making sure people, more people know about us and what we're doing and making sure that um, we're just able to, to continue bringing value and retaining those customers, which, um, you know, is more or less a full-time job uh, managing that many relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's talk about beginning farmers because you uh, farmed for a while and you've changed the styles of your farm. Talk to us about uh, what mistakes you see beginning farmers making. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely many and there, there are too many that I made. Um, some of the ones I can think of that I, I know that not only I made, but I know a lot of other folks do too is probably just like, just not thinking about it like a business. And, um, you know, I, I knew that I should, or I was told that I should, but I kind of um, thought, you know, these products will sell themselves, um, uh -huh. business plan that I don't know what all these different, um, strength, weakness, opportunity, threat analysis means. Um, this, I don't really want to spend this much time in front of a computer. That's why I did this in the first place. You know, these were, these were, um, things that I really, I really should have used these tools um, better. Yeah, and just learn what learn what businesses, um, well, what, what what a business is, and how to how to run one, and how to how to think about one. Um, so thinking about your farm like a business is definitely one. We started out, you know, way too diversified, um, and and fell into that trap multiple times. Um, you know, ecological diversity is, um, as my friend. And one of my heroes, Peter Allen, says he's essentially ecological diversity is, you know, wonderful and essential, and it is a key to having a regenerative, healthy ecosystem. But um, it it is like a there is a, a great there's a sense in which um, you know efficiency and um, resiliency, efficiency and diversity are one-to-one you know, -one odds with each other, and so we we have to simplify something, especially when we're starting out. And, you know, we started out with 
140 different varieties of vegetables and a laying flock that we didn't really understand how to take care of and was just biting off way more than we we should have and when we got into animals and and moved on to the farm we're on now we definitely bit off more than we should chew and starting more than one new thing a year i think is just uh you got to really consider um consider if you're going to be capable of, of managing that managing it well mm-hmm. um and and many, and many times we weren't capable of that and had to you know had to scramble to figure it out and not not manage things as well as they should be and then just you know i think you you gotta if it's something you're you're prone to doing i'm worrying about what other people are doing what other people have um what other people's unfair advantages are um i think it's i think it's a real danger um i think that um, you know, if you want to build a business, you have to figure out what your unfair advantages are and worry about those and exploit those. Um, we all have them, whether it's, you know, access to a market, access to land, um, access to knowledge, um, inside information where, you know, we're all going to have, have things that we can do, um, experience knowledge, um, and people, people want our food. Um, and we have to, um, have to figure out what what we have that we can bring to market that we can do so in a way that we have a uh or we're set up well to do and you know we we're not gonna we're not gonna end up um having a successful farm um if we if we're focused on what other folks are doing i guess mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah be your own farmer and know your own farm yeah yeah so if you could pick one what would be your favorite farming tool oh um I know you asked this question and I, I know thought about it some. Um, I think that, you know, I, 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 I'm going to cheat. I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I farm and I run a meat business. So I'm just going to say that, um, you know, with the, with the two sides of the business, uh, my electric fencing is the tool that makes uh-huh. everything possible. Um, whether it's like netting or single strands, um, you know, we can, we can use a small bit of pain, a small bit of electricity to um, contain, a, you know, tens of thousands of pounds of animals um, on pasture and, and have them exactly where we need them when we want them there and move them when we want them. And, um, yeah, it's, there's there's no better gift um, uh-huh. to a farmer than that. Um, and then, you know, in terms of my other business that I run, the meat selling business, I mean, having a website that looks beautiful and attractive that people can it can be selling food, whether you're awake or asleep. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a great and wonderful thing. And I wouldn't want to do this business without both of those tools, um, which, you know, so yeah, sorry for cheating on your question, but <laughs> that's, that's fine. That's about what I would say. Um, I yeah. wouldn't want to have to choose between those two things if I, if I could. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Because the one is a sales side is, you know, bringing the new customers in, but the other one is essential for controlling pastured animals. Without that, you'd be literally hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of expensive permanent fencing. Yeah. Yeah. Which is not practical. Where can people find out more about you and your work? Sure. Well, our, uh, website that I was just talking about is grossfamilyfarm.com. That's G-R-O-C-E familyfarm.com. Um, we're on Instagram. Uh, we try to be pretty present there. We've, we've been on there for a while and had really good success. Um, and, you know, we gear that more towards um, eaters and customers, but we uh-huh. talk to farmers and show what we do with farming and stuff. And, um, yeah, we've, we've, uh, we've done some teaching on marketing and Instagram stuff, um, but Instagram, Facebook, just look for gross family farm is the handle. Um, and then we do have a podcast and I more or less, um, I'm sure a lot of your, your, um, your listeners are familiar with the farmer to farmer podcast and yours is, you know, I think, uh, a good one in that vein of just somebody who knows about farming, talking to farmers about farming, Uh um, not saying it's inappropriate to stray from that, to have a non-farmer interviewing or to have, um, to have the interviewer interviewing USDA inspectors or authors or what have you those are all great things but um when when we were veg farming i just love that podcast and i love uh-huh. what what he was doing with it and i just wanted to kind of produce more or less a, a pasture based farming um version of that where you know someone who's going to ask the questions that a pasture based farmer would want to ask of the pasture based farmer and just it's kind of a talking shop it's kind of a 
um, talking to people about what what their um, their 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 greatest competencies are. So you can search for the Pastor Ace podcast wherever you find podcasts, and and we're we're out there. And um, you know we've got um, I think we've re- recorded about twenty episodes so far, and we're just whenever whenever I have time to to put more of those out, we just try to have more conversations with um, mm-hmm. some of which have been on your podcast. I'm pretty sure too. Well, that's great. Yeah, there's always um, need to be more podcasts because farmers are busy with um, all the time and they have they need to be able to have uh, earbuds in. So yeah. it's great to be able to um, share that. But so Luke, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story and your expertise and how you're running things there. And you're actually only a couple hours away from us, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, I think, uh, yeah, you're in, in Ohio, right? Yeah, so we're right in uh, the Cincinnati, well, Cincinnati metro region, more up by Dayton. But um, okay. yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, I think I think I saw on Facebook that you're selling a, a walk-in freezer. So, um, well, <laughs> you, yes, you, you probably. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, let's do a deal right now on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Well, you have a great rest of your day, Luke. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Michael. Looking to start or grow your farm business? You need a compelling farm plan that you can share with investors, convince your significant other with, or just to give yourself peace of mind. We have created a new program called the Start Your Farm Intensive. In it, you'll learn how to develop your farm idea to make sure you take all the factors into consideration for your context and your climate. You'll learn how to craft a one-page business plan that helps clearly define your target customer and lay out the necessary characteristics of your business. You will understand the three financial documents that every farm needs to fill out to make sure you are making money. And we'll give you all that as templates too. So you have the templates to fill out for your farm business. We'll also go through funding. So where to go for funding for the various stages and parts of your business. Starting a farm is hard. Starting a farm without a proven plan is almost impossible. Join us today. Go to growingfarmers.com forward slash start for more information. Now, what did past students have to say? Corey says, the exercises and spreadsheets helped me make the learning process easier and more real. Jenna says, I gained the support system and resources I needed for when I'm ready for the next step. And finally, the worksheets make you think out every aspect of the business step by step. Go ahead, join us today, growingfarmers.com forward slash start. Hey, Thriving Farmers. Next week is our 100th episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. I am so excited and grateful that I've interviewed over 100 of you to share your top tips with our audience. And we are well over a third of a million downloads. Actually, I'm not sure where we are now, but it's well over that now. And I just can't wait to share next week's guest, who is going to be an amazing mentor. And uh, of mine over the years, I would not be where we are um, in our farming journey without their help. So next week, we're going to have a special guest. I can't wait to share their wisdom with you for farming for the long term. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.